Who are you? Who am I? I have a hat, but not to wear. I wear a sword, but not to slay. And ever in my bag, I bear a pack of cards, but not to play. What are you? What are you saying? It is the language of the fairies, O oh daughter of Eve. But I never thought fairies were like you. Well, you are taller than I am. We are of such stature as we will. But the elves grow small, not large, when they would mix with mortals. You mean they are beings greater than we are? If you were to see a fairy as he truly is, look for his head above all the stars and his feet amidst the floors of the sea. Old women have taught you that fairies are too small to be seen. But I tell you, fairies are too mighty to be seen. For they are the elder gods before whom the giants were his pygmies. They are the elemental spirits, and any one of them is larger than the world. And you look for them in acorns and on toadstools and wonder you never see them. But you come in the shape and size of a man? Because I would speak with a woman. I think you are growing taller as you speak. Oh, good evening. You are Mr. Smith. I mean, you are the rector, I think? I am the rector. I am the Duke's secretary. His Grace asks me to say that he hopes to see you very soon, but he is engaged just now with the doctor. Oh, is the Duke ill? <laughs> oh, no. The doctor has come to ask him to help some cause or other. The Duke is never ill. Is the doctor with him now? Strictly speaking, he is not. The doctor has gone over the road to fetch a paper connected to his proposal, but he hasn't far to go, as you can see. That's his red lamp there at the end of his grounds. Uh, yes, I know. I'm much obliged to you. I shall wait as long as is necessary. No, it won't be very long. I beg your pardon, sir. I did not notice there was anyone here. I beg yours. A new clergyman cannot expect to be expected. I've merely come to see the Duke about some local affairs. And so, oddly enough, did I. But I suppose we should both like to get hold of him by a separate ear. Oh, uh, there's no need for disguise as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I've joined this petition for starting a model public house in the parish, and in plain words, I've come to ask His Grace for a subscription to it. And as it happens, I have joined in the petition against the erection of a model public house in this parish. The similarity of our position grows with every instant. Yes, I think we must have been twins. <laughs> well, what is a model public house? Do you mean a toy? I mean a place where an Englishman can get a decent drink and drink it decently. Do you call that a toy? No, I should call that a conjuring trick. Or, in apology to your cloth, I will say a miracle. I accept the apology to my cloth. I am merely doing my duty as a priest. How can the church make men fast if she does not allow them to feast? And when you have done feasting them, you will send them to me to be cured. Yes. And then when you're done curing them, you'll send them to me to be buried. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have all the old doctrines. It is only fair you should have all the old jokes, too. Uh, by the way, 
You call it a conjuring trick that poor people should drink moderately. I call it a chemical discovery that alcohol is not a food. So, you don't drink wine yourself, then? Drink wine? <laughs> what else is there to drink? Uh, so, drinking decently is a conjuring trick that you can do anyhow? Well, well, let us hope so. Talking about conjuring tricks, there is to be conjuring in all kinds of things here this afternoon. Conjuring, indeed, and why is that? His Grace will be with you presently. He's asked me to deal with the business matter, first of all. Well, this is rather splendid. The Duke's given £50 to the new public house. Now, the Duke is very liberal. Very. But this is rather curious. He has also given £50 to the League for opposing the new public house. The Duke is very liberal-minded. Liberal-minded? Absent-minded, I should call it. Well, yes. The Duke does suffer a little from absence of mind. He is all for compromise. Don't you know the kind of man who, when you talk to him about the five best breeds of dog, always ends up by buying a mongrel? The Duke is the kindest of men in always trying to please everybody. He generally finishes by pleasing nobody. Yes, I think I know the sort of thing. Take this conjuring, for instance. You know the Duke has two wards who are to live with him now. Yes, I believe I heard something about a nephew and a niece from Ireland. The niece came over from Ireland some months ago. The nephew comes back from America tonight. I think I will tell you all about it. In spite of your precious public house, you seem to me to be a sane man. And I fancy I shall want all the sane men I can get tonight. Well, I am at your service. You know, I rather guessed you didn't come here tonight simply to protest my precious public house. Well, you guessed right. I was family physician to the Duke's brother in Ireland. I knew the family pretty well. I suppose you mean you knew something odd about the family? Well, they saw fairies and things of that sort. And to the medical mind, seeing fairies is much the same as seeing snakes. Well, they saw them in Ireland. It's quite correct to see fairies in Ireland. It's like gambling at Monte Carlo. It's quite respectable. But I do draw the line at their seeing fairies in England. I do object to their bringing their ghosts and goblins and witches into the poor Duke's own back garden and within a yard of my own red lamp shows a lack of tact. Uh, but do I understand that the Duke's nephew and niece see witches and fairies between here and, and your lamp? Well, the nephew has been in America. Stands to reason you can't see fairies in America. <laughs> but there is this sort of superstition in the family, and I'm not easy in my mind about the girl. Why? What does she do? Oh, she wanders about the park and the woods in the evenings. Damp evenings for choice. She calls it the Celtic twilight. Hmm. I've no use for the Celtic twilight myself. It has tendency to get on the chest. <laughs> but what is worse, she is always talking about meeting somebody. Some elf or wizard or something. I don't like it at all. Have you told the Duke? Oh, yes. I told the Duke. The result was the conjurer. The conjurer? The Duke is indescribable. He will be here presently and you shall judge for yourself. Put two or three facts or ideas before him and the thing he makes out of them is always something that seems to have nothing to do with it. Hmm. Tell any other human being about a girl dreaming of the fairies and a practical brother from America and he would settle it in some obvious way and satisfy someone. Now, the Duke thinks a conjurer would just meet the case. I suppose he vaguely thinks it would brighten things up and somehow satisfy the believer's interest in supernatural things and the unbeliever's interest in smart things. As a matter of fact, the unbeliever thinks the conjurer's a fraud and the believer thinks he's a fraud too. 
The conjurer satisfies nobody. That is why he satisfies the Duke. Ah. Uh, good evening, Mr. Smith. So sorry to have kept you waiting, but we're rather in a rush today. Uh, no, Mr. Carlion is coming this evening. Yes, Your Grace, this train will be in by now. I have sent the trap. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my nephew, Dr. Grimthorpe. Uh, Morris, you know. Miss Carlion's brother from America. I hear he's been doing great things out there. Uh, petrol or something. Uh, must move with the times, eh? I'm afraid Mr. Smith doesn't always agree with moving with the time. Oh, come. Come, progress, you know. Progress. <laughs> of course I know how busy you are. You mustn't overwork yourself, you know. Hastings was telling me that you laughed over those subscriptions of mine. Well, well, I believe in looking at both sides of a question. Aspects, as old Buffle called them. Aspects. <laughs> You represent the tendency to drink in moderation, and you do good in your way. The doctor represents the tendency not to drink at all, and he does good in his way. We can't be ancient Britons, you know. <laughs> ancient Britons? Don't bother. It's only his broad-mindedness. I saw the place you're putting up for it, Mr. Smith. Very good work. Very good work indeed. Art for the people, eh? <laughs> I particularly like the woodwork over the west door. Glad to see you using the new sort of graining. Why, it all reminds one of the French Revolution. Does it remind you of the French Revolution? As much as of anything else. His grace never reminds me of anything. Say, could somebody see to this trunk? Oh, see here. Does the duke live here? Yes, only one. <laughs> well, I reckon he's the one I want anyhow. I'm his nephew. Delighted to see you, my dear boy. <laughs> Oh, I hear you've been doing very well for yourself. Well, uh, pretty well, I guess, and uh, better still for Paul T. Vandom. I manage the old man's minds out in Arizona, you know. Oh, very go-ahead, man. Very go-ahead methods, I'm told. Well, I dare say he does a great deal of good with his money, and we can't go back to the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> How's Patricia? Oh, well, she's fine, I think. She's... <laughs> Where's Patricia? Miss Carleon is walking about the grounds, I think. It's a mighty chilly night to choose. Uh, does my sister commonly select such evenings to take to the air and the dump? If I may say so, I quite agree with you. I have often taken the liberty of warning your sister against going out in all weathers like this. Well, you know, the artist's temperament. <laughs> what I always call the artistic temperament. Wordsworth, you know, and all that. All what? Well, everything's temperament, you know. Well, it's her temperament to see the fairies. It's my temperament not to see the fairies. <laughs> Why, I've walked all round the ground some 20 times and never saw a fairy. Well, it's that way with this uh, wizard, or whatever it is she calls it. Uh, for her, there is someone there. Uh, for us, there would not be someone there. <laughs> Don't you see? Somebody there? What do you mean? Uh, well... You can't quite call it a man. A man? Well, as old Buffle used to say, what is a man? With your permission, Duke, I eliminate old Buffle. Now, do you mean to suggest that some man has had the tarnation coolness to well, say Well, not a man, you know. A magician. Something mythical, you know. Not a man, but a, a medicine man. I am a medicine man. <laughs> and you don't look very mythical, Doc. 
Well, the artistic temperament, you know. See here, Duke. In most commercial ways, we're a pretty forward country. But in these moral ways, we're content to be a pretty backward country. And if you ask me whether I like my sister walking about the woods on a night like this, well, I don't. Well, I'm afraid you Americans aren't so advanced as I'd hoped. <laughs> Why, as old Buffalo used to say, there's a time when... Whose voice is that? It is no business of mine to decide. You needn't bother. I know who it is. Patricia. Morris! Oh. <laughs> Where have you been? Oh, in Fairyland. And whereabouts is that? Hmm. It's rather different from other places. It's either nowhere or it's wherever you are. Has it any inhabitants? Generally only two. One self and one shadow. But whether he is my shadow or I am his shadow is never found out. He? Hmm. Who? Oh, you needn't get conventional about it, Morris. He's not immortal. What's his name? We have no names there. You never really know anybody if you know his name. What does he look like? I've only met him in the twilight. He seems robed in a long cloak with a peaked cap or hood like the elves in my nursery stories. Sometimes when I look out of the window here, I see him passing around this house like a shadow and see his pointed hood dark against the sunset or the rising of the moon. And what does he talk about? He tells me the truth. Very many true things. He's a wizard. How do you know that he's a wizard? I suppose he plays some tricks on you. Well, I should know he was a wizard if he played no tricks. But once, he stooped, picked up a stone, and cast it into the air, and it flew up into God's heaven like a bird. Was that at first made you think he was a wizard? Oh no! When I first saw him, he was tracing circles and pentacles in the grass and talking the language of the elves. And do you know the language of the elves? Not until I heard it. See here, Patricia. I reckon that this sort of thing is going to be the limit. I am not going to have you taken in by some plain tramp or fortune teller because you choose to read minor poetry about the fairies. Now, if this gypsy or wherever he is, troubles you again, then I Come, swear- Come, you must allow a little more for poetry. We can't all feed on nothing but petrol. Quite so, quite so. And being Irish, you know, Celtic, as old Buffalo used to say. Charming songs, you know, about the Irish girl who has a plaid short. <gasps> And a banshee. <gasps> Poor old Gladstone. I thought you yourself considered the family superstition bad for the health. I consider a family superstition to be better for the health than a family quarrel. Well, it must be nice to be young and still see all those stars and sunsets. We old buffers won't be too strict with you if your view of things sometimes gets a bit mixed up, shall we say. If the stars get loose about the grass by mistake, or if once or twice the sunset gets into the east, we should only say, dream as much as you like. Dream for all mankind. Dream for us who can dream no longer. But do not quite forget the difference. What difference? The difference between the things that are beautiful and the things that are there. That red lamp over my door isn't beautiful, but it's there. You might even come to be glad it is there when the stars of gold and silver have faded. I am an old man now, but some men are still glad to find my red star. I do not say they are the wise men. Yes, I know you are good to everybody. But don't you think there may be floating 
and spiritual stars that will last longer than the red lamps. Yes, but they are fixed stars. The red lamp will last my time. Capital! <laughs> Capital! <laughs> Why, it's like Tennyson. I remember when I was an undergrad. Oh. Eh? What's the matter? The red star is gone! Ah, oh, nonsense. There's only somebody standing in front of it is all. Say, Duke, there's somebody standing in the garden. I told you we walked about the garden. It's that fortune teller of yours. Someone in the garden. Really, this land campaign? Spry fella, your friend. He slipped through my fingers like a shadow. I told you he was a shadow. Well, I guess there's going to be a shadow hunt. You got a lantern, Duke? Oh, you need not trouble. He will come if I call him. Enter all doors. Now see here, wizard. We've got you, and we know that you're a fraud. Pardon me, but I do not fancy that we know that. For myself, I must confess to something of the doctor's agnosticism. I didn't know you Parsons stuck up for any fables but your own. I stick up for the thing that every man has a right to. Perhaps the only thing that every man has a right to. And what's that? The benefit of the doubt. Even your master, the petroleum millionaire, has a right to that. I think he needs it more. I don't think there's any doubt about the question, Minister. I have met this sort of fellow often enough. The sort of fellow who wheedles money out of young girls by telling them he can make stones disappear. Do you say you can make stones disappear? Yes, I can make stones disappear. I reckon you're the kind of tough who knows how to make a watch and a chain disappear. Yes, I know how to make a watch and chain disappear. And I should think you're pretty good at disappearing yourself. I have done such a thing. Will you disappear now? No. I think I'll appear instead. Good evening, Your Grace. I'm afraid I'm rather early for the performance, but this gentleman seemed rather impatient for it to begin. Uh, good evening. <laughs> really? Are you the... Yes. I am the conjurer. <laughs> I am very sorry I am not a wizard. I wish you were a thief instead. Have I committed a crime worse than thieving? You have committed the cruelest crime I think that there is. And what is the cruelest crime? Stealing a child's toy. And what have I stolen? A fairy tale. Here are the programs of the entertainment your grace wanted. Uh, Mr. Carlion wishes to see them very much. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I carry them for your grace? No, no, no. I shan't forget them. <laughs> I shan't forget them. Why, well, you've no idea how businesslike I am. <laughs> we have to be, you know. <laughs> I know you're a bit of a socialist, but... <laughs> I assure you, there's a good deal to be done. Stake in the country, you know. Why, look at remembering faces now. The king never forgets faces. I never forget faces. <laughs> Why, the professor here, who performs before the king, well, you see it on the caravans, you know, performs before the king almost every night, I suppose. I sometimes let his majesty have an evening off. 
turn my attention, of course, to the very highest nobility. Hey. <laughs> but naturally, I perform for every sovereign potentate, black and white. There's never been a conjurer who hasn't. Uh, that's right. That's right. And, and you say with me that the great business for a king is remembering people? I should say it's remembering which people to remember. <laughs> well, well, now, being really business-like... Shall I take the programmes for your grace? Uh, no. <laughs> no, uh, I shan't forget them. I shan't forget them. Is there anything else? Uh, I have to go down to the village about the wire to Stratford. The only other thing at all urgent is the militant vegetarians. Ah, the militant vegetarians? <laughs> You've heard of them, I'm sure. You won't obey the law so long as the government serves out meat. Let them be comforted. There are a great many people who don't get much meat. Well, I'm bound to say they're very enthusiastic uh, and advanced, too. Uh, 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 certainly advanced, yes. Like Joan of Arc. Was Joan of Arc a vegetarian? You know, it's a very high ideal, after all. Uh, the sacredness of life. Well, you know, uh, the sacredness of life. <laughs> uh, but they carry it too far. They killed a policeman down in Kent. Killed a policeman? A vegetarian? Well, I suppose it was, so long as they didn't need him. They're only asking for small subscriptions. Uh, indeed, they prefer to collect a large number of half-crowns to prove the popularity of their movement. But I should advise... Give them three shillings, then. But if I might suggest... Oh, hang it all. We give them to vegetarians three shillings. It only seems fair. If I might suggest anything, Your Grace. I think Your Grace would be wise not to subscribe in this case. The anti-vegetarians have already used their funds to form gangs, ostensibly to protect their own meetings. And if the vegetarians use their funds to break up those meetings, well, it will look rather funny that we have paid roughs on both sides. It will be rather difficult to explain when it comes before the magistrate. But I shall be the magistrate. That's the system, my dear Hastings. That's the advantage of the system. It's not a logical system. There's no Rousseau in it, but you see how well it works? I shall be the very best magistrate that could be on the bench. The others would be biased, you know. Old Sir Lawrence is a vegetarian himself and might be hard on the anti-vegetarian roughs. Colonel Crashaw would be sure to be hard on the vegetarian roughs, but if I've paid both of them, of course, I shan't be hard on either of them. <laughs> and there you have it. Just perfect impartiality. Shall I take the programs, Your Grace? No, no. I shan't forget them. I shan't forget them. Well, Professor, uh, what's the news in the conjuring world? I'm afraid there's never any news in the Conjuring world. Uh, haven't you got a newspaper or something? <laughs> Everyone has a newspaper now, you know. The uh, Daily Sword Swallower, that sort of thing. Uh, no, I have been a journalist myself, but I think that journalism and Conjuring will always be incompatible. Incompatible? Yeah, that's where we differ. That's where I take larger views. Larger laws, as old Buffle used to say. Why, nothing is incompatible. Except husband and wife, and so on. <laughs> well, you must speak with Morris about that. It's wonderful the way that incompatibility has gone forward in the States. I only mean that the two trades rest on opposite principles. The whole point of being a conjurer is that you won't explain a thing that has happened. Well, and the journalist. Well, the whole point of being a journalist is that you do explain a thing that hasn't happened. <laughs> uh, but you'll want somewhere to discuss the new tricks. There are no new tricks. And if there were, we wouldn't want them discussed. 
But I'm afraid you're not really that advanced. <laughs> are you interested in modern progress? Oh, yes, we are interested in all tricks done by illusion. <laughs> well, I must go see how Morris is. Pleasure of seeing you later. Why are nice men such asses? <laughs> well, that seems all right. The pack of cards that is a pack of cards. The pack of cards that isn't a pack of cards. The hat that looks like a gentleman's hat. But which in reality is no gentleman's hat, only my hat. And I am not a gentleman, I am only a conjurer. This is only a conjurer's hat. I cannot take this hat off to a lady. I can take goldfish out of it, rabbits out of it, snakes out of it, only I mustn't take my own head out of it. Suppose I'm a lower animal than a rabbit or a snake, they can get out of a conjurer's hat and I can't. <laughs> I am a conjurer, nothing else but a conjurer. Unless I could show I was something else. And that would be worse. I beg your pardon. Came to get some programs. My uncle wants them. Miss Cullion, might I speak with you a moment? The question is purely practical. I can hardly imagine what the question can be. I am the question. And what have I to do with that? You have everything to do with it. I am the question. You... Well, what am I? You are the answer. The answer to what? The answer to me. You think I'm a liar because I walked about the fields with you and said I can make stones disappear. Well, so I can. I am a conjurer. In point of fact, it wasn't a lie. But if it had been a lie, I would have told it just the same. I would have told 20 such lies. You may or may not know why. I know nothing about such lies. I don't know if you have any notion what it means for a man like me to talk to a lady like you, even under false pretenses. I am an adventurer. I am a blackguard. If one can earn the title by being in all the blackguard societies of the world. <laughs> I've thought everything out by myself. When I was a gutter snipe in Fleet Street, <laughs> or lower still, a journalist in Fleet Street. Until I met you, I never guessed that rich people ever thought at all. Well, that is all I wanted to say. <laughs> we had some good conversations, didn't we? I am a liar, but I told you a great deal of truth. Yes, you did tell me a great deal of the truth. You told me hundreds and thousands of truths, but you never told me the truth that one wants to know. What is that? You never told me the truth about yourself. You never told me that you were only the conjurer. I did not tell you that because I do not even know it. I do not know that I am only the conjurer. What do you mean? Sometimes I'm afraid I'm something worse than the conjurer. I cannot think of anything worse than a conjurer who does not call himself a conjurer. There is something worse, but that is not what I wanted to say. Do you really find that very unpardonable? Come, let me put to you a case. Never mind about whether it is our case. <clears throat> a man spends his time incessantly in going about in third-class carriages to fifth-rate lodgings. He has to make up new tricks, new patter, new nonsense almost every night of his life. Mostly, he has to do it in the beastly black cities to the Midlands in the north where he can't get out into the country. And now and again, he does it at a gentleman's country house where he can get out into the country. 
Well, you know that actors and orators and all sorts of people like to rehearse their effects in the open air if they can. You know the story of the great statesman? He was overheard by his own gardener saying as he paced the grounds, had I, Mr. Speaker, had the slightest intimation that I would have been called upon to speak this evening. <laughs> well, conjurers are just the same. It takes some time to prepare an impromptu. <laughs> A man like that walks about the woods and fields doing all his tricks beforehand and talking all sorts of gibberish because he thinks he is alone. Then, one night, this gentleman found that he was not alone. He found a very beautiful child was watching him. A child? Yes. That was his first impression. He's an intimate friend of mine. I have known him my whole life. He tells me he has since discovered that she is not a child, for she does not fulfill the definition. But what is the definition of a child? Somebody you can play with. Why did you wear that cloak with the hood up? I think it escaped your notice it was raining. <laughs> and what did this friend of yours do? You've already told me what he did. He destroyed a fairy tale. For he created a fairy tale that he was bound to destroy. But do you blame a man very much, Mrs. Carley, and if... He enjoyed the only fairy tale he had had in his life. Suppose he said to you that the silly circles he was drawing for practice were really magic circles. Suppose he said the Bosch he was speaking was the language of the elves. Remember, he has read fairy tales as much as you have. Fairy tales are the only democratic institutions. All the classes have heard all the fairy tales. You blame him very much if he too tried to have a holiday in fairyland. I blame him less than I did. But I still say there can be nothing worse than false magic. And after all, it was he who brought the false magic. Yes. And it was she who brought the real magic. I know that one, I know that one, I know that one. <laughs> this is the false bottom. I know that one, that one rocks the wire, that one goes up the sleeve, that's the subject of a pack of cards. Really? I know that Morris, one. you mustn't talk as if you knew everything. Oh, I don't mind anyone knowing everything, Mrs. Carly, and there's actually something much more important than knowing how a thing is done. Oh, and what's that? Knowing how to do it. <laughs> that's so, eh? Being the high-toned conjurer now because he can't any longer take all the sidewalk as a fairy. Really, Morris? You are very rude. And it's quite ridiculous to be rude. And this gentleman was only practicing some tricks by himself in the garden. If there was any mistake, it was mine. Come. Shake hands or whatever men do when they apologize. Don't be silly. He won't turn you into a bowl of goldfish. Well, I guess that's so. <laughs> Shake. And you won't turn me into a bowl of goldfish anyhow, Professor. I understand that when you do produce a bowl of goldfish, they are generally slips of carrot. That is so, Professor? Yes. Judge for yourself. Very good. Very good. I, I, I know how that's done. I, I, I know how that's done. Uh, you have an India rubber cap, you know, or a, or a cover. Yes. Ah. <laughs> Most mysteries are tolerably plain, if you know the apparatus. I guess I wish we had all the old apparatus of all the old priests and prophets since the beginning of the world. I guess most of the old miracles were a matter of just panel and wires. <laughs> I don't quite understand you. What old apparatus do you want so much? Sir, I just want that old apparatus that turned rods into snakes. 
I want those smart appliances, sir, that brought water out of a rock when old man Moses chose to hit it. I want those conjurers here who called themselves patriarchs and prophets in your precious Bible. Morris, you mustn't talk like that. Well, I don't believe in religion. Hush, hush. Nobody but women believe in religion. I think this is a fitting opportunity to show you another ancient conjuring trick. Which one is that? The Vanishing Lady. You know, there is one part of their old apparatus that I regret especially being lost. What's that? The apparatus for writing the Book of Job. Well, well. They didn't know everything in those old times. No. And in those old times, they knew they didn't. Where shall wisdom be found? And what is the place of understanding? Somewhere in America, I believe. <laughs> Man knoweth not the price thereof. Neither is it found in the land of the living. The deep saith it is not in me. The sea saith it is not in me. Death and destruction say we have heard tell of it. But God understandeth the way thereof, and he knoweth the place thereof. For he looketh to the ends of the earth, and seeth under the whole of heaven. And to man he hath said, Behold, the fear of the Lord that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Hmm. How's that for agnosticism, Dr. Grimthorpe? What a pity that apparatus is lost. Well, you may just smile how you choose, I reckon. <laughs> but I still say the conjurer here could be the biggest man in the big blessed centuries if he could just show us how the holy old tricks were done. I mean, we must say this for old man Moses. He was in advance of his time. When he did the old tricks, they were new tricks. He got the pull on the public. He could do his tricks before grown men, great bearded frightened men who would sing psalms and win battles. But this modern conjuring, it's all behind the times. It's why they only do it with schoolboys. There's not a trick on this table that I don't know. The whole trade is as dead as mutton and not as half as satisfying. Why, <laughs> A moment or two ago, he brought out a bowl of goldfish. An old trick that anybody could do. <laughs> oh, I quite agree. The apparatus is perfectly simple. By the way, let me have a look at those goldfish of yours, will you? I am not a paid play actor come here to conjure. I'm not here to do stale tricks. I'm here to see through them. I say it's an old trick. True. I... But as you say, we only show it. To schoolboys. And who, might I ask you, Professor Hocus Pocus, or whatever your name is, is it that you are calling a schoolboy? I beg your pardon. Your sister will tell you I am often mistaken about children. I forbid you to appeal to my sister. That is exactly what a schoolboy would do. I am not a schoolboy. I am a quiet businessman. And I tell you, in the country that I come from, the hand of a quiet businessman oftentimes goes to his hip pocket at an insult like that. Let it go to his pocket! I thought the hand of a quiet businessman more often went into someone else's pocket. Oh, you dirty... Gentlemen, I think you are both forgetting yourselves. Perhaps. I beg pardon for what I said. It was certainly in excess of the young gentleman's deserts. Sometimes wish I rather could forget myself. Well, the entertainment's coming on. And you English don't like a scene. I reckon I'll have to bury the blamed old hatchet too. Mr. Carleon, you will forgive an old man who knew your father well. If he doubts whether you're doing yourself justice, in treating yourself as an American Indian merely because you have lived in America. In my old friend Huxley's time, we of the middle classes disbelieved in reason and all sorts of things. But we did believe in good manners. 
it is a pity if the aristocracy can't. I don't like to hear you say you are a savage and have buried a tomahawk. I would rather hear you say, as your Irish ancestors would have said, that you have sheathed your sword with the dignity proper to a gentleman. Very well. I've sheathed my sword with the dignity proper to a gentleman. And I have sheathed my sword with the dignity proper to a conjurer. That is a conjurer's sheath a sword. Swallows it. <laughs> then we all agree there shall be no quarrel. Uh, may I say a word? I have a great dislike of a quarrel for a reason far beyond my duty to my cloth. And what's that? I dislike a quarrel because it always interrupts an argument. Uh, may I bring you back for a moment to the argument? You were saying that these modern conjuring tricks are simply the old miracles once they've been found out. But surely another view is possible. When we speak of things being sham, we generally mean that they are an imitation of that which is genuine. Uh, take that Reynolds of the Duke's great-grandfather. If I were to say that it was a copy... <laughs> well, uh, the Duke is real amiable, but I reckon you'd find what you call the interruption of an argument. Yes, but... Suppose I did say so. You wouldn't take that to mean that Sir Joshua Reynolds never lived. Why should sham miracles prove to us that real saints and prophets never lived? There may be sham magic and real magic also. There may be turnip ghosts precisely because there are real ghosts. There may be theatrical fairies precisely because there are real fairies. You don't abolish the Bank of England by pointing to a forged banknote. I hope the professor enjoys being called a forged banknote. Almost as much as being called the prospectus of some American companies. Gentlemen, gentlemen. I am sorry. Well, let's have the argument first and we can have the quarrel afterwards. I'll clean this house of some encumbrances. Now see here, Mr. Smith. I'm not putting anything on your Real miracle notion, I say. And science says that there is a cause for everything. Science will soon find out that cause. And sooner or later, your old miracle will look mighty mean. Sooner or later, science will botanize a bit on your turnip ghosts and make you look turnips yourselves for having taken any. <laughs> I don't like this peaceful argument of yours. The boy is getting much too excited. You say that old man Reynolds lived, and science don't say no, but he's dead now, and you'll no more raise your saints and your prophets than you'll raise the Duke's great-grandfather to dance on that wall. Why, the picture is moving! You were in the room before us. Do you reckon that will take us in? You can do all that with wires! Yes, I could do all that with wires. And you reckon that I shouldn't know? Why, that is how the darn dirty spiritualists do all their tricks. They say they can make furniture move of itself. And if it does move, they move it. And we mean to know how. Uh, 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 everyone knows that one. Um, a, a slide and plank. It can be done with a slide and plank. Yes, it can be done with a sliding plank. You were right on the spot there, Doc, when you talked about that red lamp of yours. That red lamp is the light of science that will put out all the fires of your turnip ghosts. It's a consuming fire, Doctor, but it is the red lamp of the morning. <laughs> you, priest, can no more stop that light from shining or change its radiance than Joshua could stop the sun and the moon. Why? <laughs> A real fairy in an elven clock straight tuned that lamp an hour or two ago and turned into a common society clown with a white tie. Wait a moment. I've got you. I'll have you. Could be done with wires. <laughs> <laughs> 
You have a wire. Well, well, just at this moment, we need not inquire. <laughs> you call yourself a man of science, and you dare tell me not to inquire. No, we only mean that for the moment you might let it alone. No, priest, I will not let it alone. Could it be done in the years? You have a mirror! No, I, 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 I've got it! I've got it! Mixture of lights! Why not? If you throw a green light onto a red light, you don't get blue. If you have done this trick, for God's sake, undo it! <laughs> it's the glass! You've done something in the glass! I do not think you will find anything wrong with the glass. Then I will find out what is wrong with the lamp! It is still a wet night, I'm afraid. Yes. Now somebody else will be wandering about the garden. In this case, I don't suppose the Celtic twilight will get on the chest. Oh, if it were only the chest. Where's my brother? I am afraid he is walking about in fairyland. But he mustn't go out on a night like this. It's very dangerous. It is dangerous. He might meet a fairy. What do you mean? You went out in this sort of weather and you met this sort of fairy and so far it has only brought you sorrow. I'm going out to find my brother. She's not singing those songs to him, is she? No, he does not understand the language of the elves. Then what are all those cries and gasps I hear? The normal noises, I think, of a quiet businessman. <laughs> Sir, I understand you're being bitter, for I admit you have been uncivilly received. But to speak like that just now. May I speak to the doctor? My dear lady, certainly. Shall I fetch the duke? I prefer the doctor. Uh, may I be of any I use? I only want to speak to the doctor! <laughs> God. That last was a wonderful trick of yours. Thank you. I suppose you mean it was the only one you didn't see through? Something of the kind, I confess. That last was the best trick I've ever seen. It was so good that I wish you had not done it. So do I. How do you mean? Do you mean you wish you'd never been a conjurer? I wish I'd never been born. It is all right so far. We have brought him back. You told me that there was mental trouble with the girl. No, I told you there was mental trouble in the family. Ah. Well, where is Mr. Morris Carlion? I have got him into bed in the next room. His sister is looking after him. His sister? Oh, then you do believe in fairies. Believe in fairies? What do you mean? At least you put the person who does believe in fairies in charge of the person who doesn't. Well, I suppose I do. And you don't think that she'll keep him up all night with her fairy tales? Certainly not. You don't think that she'll throw the medicine bottle out window and administer a, a dewdrop or something of the sort? Or a four-leaved clover, say? No, of course not. I only ask because you scientific men are a little hard on us clergymen. You don't believe in a priesthood, but you'll admit that I'm more really a priest than this conjurer is really a magician. You talk about the Bible and the higher criticism, but even by the higher criticism, the Bible is older than the language of the elves, which, as far as I can make out, was invented this afternoon. 
Miss Carlion believed in the wizard. Miss Carlion believed in the language of the elves, and then you put her in charge of an invalid without a flicker of a doubt. Because you trust women. Yes, I trust women. You'll trust a woman with the practical issues of life and death through sleepless hours when an extra grain or a shaking hand might kill. Yes. Yeah. But if that woman gets up early to go to service in my church, you call her weak-minded and say that only a woman could believe in religion. I should never call this woman weak-minded. No, by God. Not even if she went to church. But there are as many strong-minded who believe passionately in going to church. Weren't there as many who believed passionately in Apollo? And what harm came from believing in Apollo? And what a massive harm may have come from not believing in Apollo? Does it never strike you that doubt may be a madness as well as faith? That asking questions could be a disease as well as proclaiming doctrines? Uh, you talk of religious mania, but is there no such thing as irreligious mania? Is there no such thing in this house at this moment? Then you think no one should question at all? I think that that is what comes of questioning! Why can't you let the universe alone and just let it mean what it likes? Why shouldn't the thunder be Jupiter? More men have worried themselves silly wondering what the devil it was if it wasn't Jupiter. And it... <laughs> Do you believe in your own religion? <sighs> Suppose I don't. I should still be a fool to question it. Child who doubts about Santa Claus has insomnia. Child who believes has a good night's rest. You are a pragmatist. That is what the lawyers call vulgar abuse. But I do appeal to practice. Here is a family over which you tell me a mental calamity hovers. Here is a boy who questions everything, and a girl who can believe in anything. Upon which has the curse fallen? Uh, talking about the pragmatists? Uh, yeah, I'm glad to hear a very forward movement. Uh, I suppose Roosevelt now. Uh, <gasps> well, <laughs> we move, you know. We move. Uh, first, there was the missing link. Yeah, no, no. First, there was protoplasm. Then there was the missing link and Magna Carta and so on. <laughs> I look at the Insurance Act. I would rather not. Ah, prejudice? <laughs> prejudice. Well, you doctors, you know. <laughs> Never had any myself. Any what? Never had any Marconis myself. <laughs> Wouldn't touch them. Well, uh, well, uh, I must go speak to Hastings. <laughs> Hastings? Well, of all the... You asked just now which member of the family had inherited the family madness. Yes, I did. On my living soul, I believe it must be the Duke. Forgive me, but may I detain you for one moment? I suppose you are aware that, that there have been rather grave developments 
in the case of illness which happened after your performance. I would not say, of course, because of your performance. Thank you. Nevertheless, mental excitement is necessarily an element of importance in physiological troubles. And your triumphs this evening were really so extraordinary that I cannot pretend to dismiss them from my patient's case. He is at present in a state somewhat analogous to delirium, but one in which he can still partially ask and answer questions. The question he continually asks is how you managed to do your last trick. My last trick? Now, I was wondering whether we could make any arrangement which would be fair to you in the matter. Would it be possible for you to give me, in confidence, the means of satisfying this, this fixed idea he seemed to have got? This special case of semi-delirious disputation is a rare one and collected in my experience with rather unfortunate cases. Do you mean he is going mad? Really? You ask me an unfair question. I could not explain the fine shades of these things to a layman. And even if, if what you say were so, I should have to regard it as a professional secret. And don't you think you ask me a rather unfair question, Dr. Grimthorpe? If yours is a professional secret, is not mine a professional secret too? If you may hide truth from the world, why may not I? You don't tell your tricks, I don't tell my tricks. Ours are not tricks. Oh, well, no one can be sure of that until the tricks are told. But the public can see a doctor's cures as plain yes, as... Yes, as plain as they saw the red lamp over his door this evening. Your secret, of course, would be strictly kept by everyone involved. No, oh, of course. People in delirium often keep secrets strictly. No one sees the patient but his sister and myself. Yes, his sister. Is she very anxious? What would you suppose? Doctor, there are about a thousand reasons why I should not tell you how I did that last trick. But one would suffice because it is the most practical of all. Well, and why shouldn't you tell me? Because you wouldn't believe me if I did. It is so very kind of you to have waited, Professor. I expect Dr. Grimthorpe has explained the little difficulty we're in much better than I could. <laughs> Nothing like the medical mind for a scientific statement. <laughs> Look at Ibsen. Of course, the professor feels considerable reluctance in the matter. He points out that his secrets are an essential part of his profession. Oh, quite so, of course, of course. Tricks of the trade, eh? Very proper, of course. Uh, quite a case of noblesse oblige. Eh? <laughs> but I dare say we shall be able to find a way out of the matter. <laughs> now, my dear sir, I hope you will not be offended if I say that this ought to be a business matter. <laughs> we are asking you for a piece of your professional work and knowledge. And if I may have the pleasure of writing you a check. I thank your grace. I have already received my check from your secretary. You will find it on the counterfoil just after the check you so kindly gave to the Society for the Suppression of Conjuring. <laughs> now, I don't want you to take it that way. You take it in a broader way. You're free, you know. Modern and all that. <laughs> Wonderful man, Bernard Shaw. 
If you feel any delicacy, the payment need not be made merely to you. I quite respect your feelings in the matter. Quite so. Quite so. Haven't you got a cause or something? Everyone has a cause now, you know. <laughs> Conjurers, widows, or something of that sort. No, I have no widows. Well, then some sort of a pension or annuity for any widows you may procure. <laughs> Come. Let me call it a couple of thou. You would really be willing to pay a sum like this to know how I did that last trick? Well, I would willingly pay much more. I think I explained to you that the case is serious. You would pay much more. Suppose I tell you the secret and you find there's nothing in it. You mean that it's really quite simple? Why, I should say that would be the best thing that could possibly happen. A little healthy laughter is the best possible thing for convalescence. I do not think you would laugh. But, as you say, it is something quite simple. It is the simplest thing that there is. That is why you will not laugh. Why? What do you mean? What shall we do? You would disbelieve. And why? Because it is so simple. You ask me how I did that last trick, I'll tell you how I did that last trick. I did it by magic. Do you really mean that you take the check and then tell us it was only magic? I tear the check and tell you it was only magic. But hang it all, there's no such thing. Yes, there is. I wish to God I did not know that there is. Why, really? <laughs> magic? Yes, Your Grace. One of those larger laws you were telling us about? One moment, sir. What do you want? I want to apologize to you. On behalf of the company, I think it was wrong to offer you money. I think it was more wrong to call the thing delirium and mystify you with medical language. Of more respect for a conjurer's patter than for doctor's patter. Both are meant to stupefy, but yours only to stupefy for a moment. <laughs> now, I will put it to you in plain words on plain human Christian grounds. Here is a poor boy who may be going mad. Suppose you had a son in such a position. Would you not expect someone to tell you the whole truth if it could help you? Yes, and I have told you the whole truth. Go and find out if it helps you. You know quite well it will not help us. Why not? You know quite well why not. You are an honest man and you've said it yourself. Because the boy will not believe it. What, does anybody believe it? Do you believe it? Your question is quite fair. Come, sit. Let us talk. Let me take your cloak. I will take off my cloak when you take off your coat. Why? Do you want me to fight? I want you to be martyred. I want you to bear witness to your own creed. I say these things are supernatural. I say this was done by a spirit. The doctor does not believe me. He is an agnostic. He knows everything. The duke does not believe me. He cannot believe anything so plain. It's a miracle. And what the devil are you for if you don't believe in a miracle? What does your coat mean if it doesn't mean there's such a thing as a supernatural? What does your cursed collar mean if it doesn't mean there's such a thing as a spirit? Why the devil do you dress up like that if you don't believe in it? Or perhaps you don't believe in devils. I believe the... I wish I could believe. Yes. 
And I wish I could disbelieve. May I speak to the conjurer? Oh, would you like the doctor? No, the conjurer. Are there any developments? I only want to speak to the conjurer! <laughs> you must tell me how you did the trick. You will. I know you will. Oh, I know my poor brother was rude to you. He's rude to everybody. But he's such a little, little boy. I suppose you know there are things men never tell to women. They are too horrible. Yes, and there are things women never tell to men. They also are too horrible. I'm here to hear them all. Do you really mean I may say anything I like? No matter how dark it is, no matter how dreadful it is, no matter how damnable it is. I've gone through too much to be terrified now. Tell me the very worst. I will tell you the very worst. I fell in love with you when I first saw you. You told me I looked like a child. I lied. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> it was in love I took an opportunity. You believe quite simply that I was a magician. It is yeah. terrible, it is terrible. I never believed you were a magician. You never believed I was a magician? I always knew you were a man. I am a man. And you are a woman. All the elves have gone to Elfland and all the devils to hell and you and I will walk out of this great vulgar house tonight and be married. Everyone is crazy in this house tonight, I think. <laughs> <laughs> what am I saying is if you can marry me? This is the first time you have failed in courage. What do you mean? I mean to draw your attention to the fact that you have recently made an offer. I accept it. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. How can a man marry an archangel, let alone a lady? My mother was a lady who married a dying fiddler who tramped the roads. The mixture placed a cat and banjo with my body and soul. I can see my mother cooking meals in dirtier and dirtier lodgings and donning socks with weaker and weaker eyes when she might have worn pearls by consenting to be a rational person. And she might have grown pearls by consenting to be an oyster. There was very little pleasure in her life. There is little, a very little in everybody's. The question is what kind? We can't turn life into a pleasure, but we can choose such pleasures as are worthy of us and our immortal souls. Your mother chose, and I have chosen. Immortal souls. <laughs> I suppose if I knelt down to worship you, you and everyone else would laugh. Well, I think this. It's a much more comfortable way. Yes. I'll do everything your mother did. Not so well, of course. I'll darn that conjurer's hat. Does one darn hats? And cook the conjurer's dinner. By the way, what is the conjurer's dinner? It's always the goldfish, of course. <laughs> Carrots. And... <laughs> And of course, now I come to think of it, you can always take rabbits out of the hat. Why? What a cheap life it must be. <laughs> How do you cook rabbits? The Duke's always talking about poached rabbits. <laughs> really? We shall be as happy as is good for us. We'll have confidence in each other, at least. And no secrets. I insist on knowing all the tricks. 
I don't know whether I'm on my head or my heels. And now, as we're going to be so confidential and comfortable, you'll just tell me the real, practical, tricky little way you did that last trick. How I did that last trick? I did it by devils. You can believe in fairies, can't you believe in devils? No! I can't believe in devils. Well, this room is full of them. What does it all mean? It only means that I have done what many men have done, but few, I think, have thriven by. I told you that I'm... I mix with many queer sets of people. Among others, I mixed with those who pretend truly or falsely to do our tricks by the aid of spirits. I dabbled a little in table wrapping and table turning, but I soon had calls to give it up. Why did you give it up? It began by giving me headaches. And I found that each morning after a spiritual seance, I had a queer feeling of loneliness and degradation of having been soiled. Much like the feeling I suppose people have the morning after they have been drunk, but I happen to have what people call a strong head, and I have never really been drunk. I'm glad of that. Well, it wasn't for want of trying. But it wasn't soon thereafter that the... Uh, Spirits with whom I had been playing at table turning did what I think they generally do at the end of such table turning. What did they do? They turned the tables. They turned the tables upon me. I don't wonder at your believing in fairies as long as these things were my... Servants, they seem to me to be like fairies, but when they tried to be my masters, I found that they were not fairies. I found that the spirits with whom at least I had been in contact with were evil, awfully unnaturally evil. Did they say so? Don't talk of what they said! I was a loose fellow, but I had not fallen so low as such things. I resisted them. And after a very tough time, psychologically speaking, I cut the connection. But they were always tempting me to use the supernatural power I had got from them. It wasn't very great. It was enough to move things about in alter light and so on. I don't know if you have any idea what a strain it is on a man to drink bad coffee in a coffee stall when he knows he has just enough magic in him to make a bottle of champagne walk out of an empty shop. I think you behaved very well. But when I fell at last, it was for nothing half so clean and Christian as champagne. In black, blind pride and anger and all sorts of heathenry because of the impudence of a schoolboy. I called on the fiend. And they obeyed. Poor fellow. Your goodness is the only goodness that never goes wrong. And what are we to do with Morris? I, I believe you now, my dear. But he, he will never believe. There is no bigot like the atheist. 
I must think. Where are you going? I am going to ask the God whose enemies I have served if I am still worthy to save a child. Remarkable man, that Condra. Clever man. Curious man. Very curious man. A kind of man, you know. Lord bless us, what's that? What's what, eh? What's what? I swear, I heard a footstep. Why, <gasps> <laughs> Hastings! <laughs> Hastings, we thought you were a ghost. You must be looking white or something. I have brought back the answer of the anti-vegetarian. I mean the vegetarian. He stinks. You uh, are looking white. I ask your grace's pardon. I, I had a slight shock on entering the room. A shock? What shock? It is the first time I, I think your grace's work has ever been disturbed by any private feelings of mine. I shall not trouble your grace with them. It will not happen again. What a remarkable woman! I wonder if she has any idea. How do you feel? I uh, feel as if I must have a window shut. No, I have it, have it open. I don't know which it is. I'm... No. Oh God, in God's name, go! Really, sir? I'm not used to being spoken no, to. No, it was not you whom I told to go. No. But I think I will go. This room is simply horrible. Room horrible? Room horrible? No, this is only a little crowded. Only a little crowded. I don't seem to know all the people. Well, you can't like everyone, you know, these large at home. Go back to hell from which I called you! It's the last order I shall give! And what are you going to do? I am going to tell that poor little lad a lie. I have found in the garden what he could not find in the garden. I have managed to think of a natural explanation of that trick. I think you are something like a great man. Can I take your explanation to him now? No. Thank you. I will take it myself. We all felt devilishly queer just now. Wonderful things there are in the world. <laughs> I suppose it's all electricity. <laughs> I think there was more than electricity in all this. Oh, Morris is ever so much better. The conjurer has told him such a good story of how the trick was done. Professor, we owe you a thousand thanks. Really? You have doubled your claim to originality. It is much more marvelous to explain a miracle than to work a miracle. Uh, wh what was your explanation, by the way? I shall not tell you. Indeed. 
And why not? Because God and the demons and that immortal mystery that you deny have been in this room tonight. Because you know it has been here. Because you have felt it here. Because you know the demons as well as I do and fear them as much as I do. Well, because all this would not avail. If I told you the lie that I told Maurice Carleon about how I did that trick. Uh, yes. You would believe it as he believed it. You cannot think how that trick could be done naturally. I alone found out how it could be done after I had done it by magic. But if I tell you a natural way of doing it... Well? Half an hour after I left, you would all be saying how it was done. Goodbye. I shall not say goodbye. You are great as well as good. But a saint can be a temptress as well as a sinner. I leave my honor in your hands. Oh yes, I have a little left. We began as a fairy tale. Have I any right to take advantage of that fairy tale? Has not the fairy tale really and truly come to an end? Yes. That fairy tale has really and truly come to an end. It is very hard for a fairy tale to come to an end. If you leave it alone, it lingers everlastingly. Our fairy tale has come to an end and the only way a fairy tale can come to an end. The only way a fairy tale can leave off being a fairy tale. I don't understand you. It has come true. 